question was on money, on money laundering and placement. And so persons would have sent that in. And then question two was on terrorism. And so uh, we saw that, you know, um, Ben Laden lived for 10 years and he lived without the bank and he lived without being able to work. And so we wanted to find out exactly how did he stay alive and live such a comfortable life. And from our readings, we saw that it was because of his very strong network, right? So we um, want to ensure that we build a network that's just as strong, but we use it for good, right? And so somebody is saying, I'm new and I need you to send me that email with the homework. Okay, um, Owen, can you give me your email address? So let me send that to you right now. So um, you can get to it. So if you want to type your email in the chat, that, that, would, that would be helpful. Um, so any questions any or comments or concerns from last week? Um, are we clear? We have an overview and we know what the expectations are. We can look at those homework questions and if they appear on the final exam, we can definitely answer them. That's mom. You're sure? Okay. But, All right. Like, um, if any questions come up, we will most definitely ask. Okay, great. Very good. Very good. Okay, so then um, who wants to get their 5% a day? Who would have read the newspaper this week and wants to share? Now, so far, I have Melissa's name. Hey, is it Melissa or Michelle? I keep getting it wrong. I read for us last week. It's Melissa. Don't give my points to Michelle. Okay, <laughs> Melissa. I, I check in my book right now. I see your name right there. Miss Bullard, don't forget me for the WhatsApp group. Sorry? Don't forget me for starting the WhatsApp group. My little 5% too. Who's this? Who's this? Who started Lavastier. the group? Lavastier. Yes. Okay, Lavastier. Yes, I appreciate you doing for being... Because yeah, there's a headache sometimes with these groups. So yeah, very good. But, but, but our group so far is functioning. I, I, I like it so far. Very okay. helpful. Good. And please, you all share, share your um, readings and um, tips, and you help each other through it. You network through that WhatsApp group. So very good. So let me add uh, the Okay. So who else? Who who read the newspaper and want, wants to share with us? Hey, Ms. I Ola, this, Renee. This is, this is Michelle. Okay. I, I have uh, something to share. Okay, go. Vashti, Renee, and Michelle. Okay, so go ahead, um, Renee, and, and share with us what you read in the newspaper. Okay, so I read the newspaper yesterday, and two articles stood out to me. The first being with the director of labor, Robert Farkerson, when he stated that employers are forcing employees to get vaccinated. He also stated that in some instances, employees have been fired file trade disputes and their matters will be dealt with by the courts. The second article that stood out was in the business section of the Tribune. The Honorable Michael Pindad accused the government of failing to comply with financial transparency and disclosure laws. He also said that the government failed to publish a 2021 fiscal strategy report, which provides the foundation for the government's economic and fiscal planning and annual budget by the third week of November as mandated by the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Okay, and so what is the outcome? Why Why didn't they file it? And who are the enforcers? Did it go on to what? say? I didn't read. I didn't see that part on it, but I could love to see if I see it. Okay, yeah, so this see- was a, This was a headline. Okay, so see if you can do some research and get, you know, give us some information, like who's in charge? How is the government allowed not to file this report? Okay, okay. and okay. then again, with, with the um, employers not being able to, um, to let people go because they're not vaccinated. Um, I don't know if we, any of us listen to the UK news, but in the UK, they just passed legislation to say the COVID passport is no longer required you know, require, not, no longer required to wear masks and everybody must learn to live with the flu. Did anybody see that in the UK news? Yeah, yes, I did actually. Ms. Yes, ma'am, I saw that. Right, and so therefore, um, you know, we always a few steps behind. So um, I'm certain and I, I'm very surprised that this government is allowing 
um, persons to be fired or because they are not vaccinated when all the persons that were fined and charged doing you know, COVID and breaking the curfew, they, they took away those fines or they, they sent the money back or something to that effect. Or all the persons that were charged did not have to pay those fines, even though the previous government tooted that they collected more than a million dollars in fines. Right? Ms. Blart, it's funny though, because France just approved legislation that says that makes it legal now to have to show a vaccine passport to get into public spaces like restaurants and um, theaters and cinemas and that kind of stuff. Wow. So, yeah, so, so it, it's, <laughs> it's confusing. It's, it's confusing and it depends on where you are. Yeah, but you know, we are common law, so I would think. We are common law jurisdiction, so I would think we would follow what the UK does. France is civil law. And so, you know, there's a little bit of a difference. So it'll be interesting then to see um, um, what happens um, in, in terms of, um, you know, what decision we go with. But nevertheless, stay tuned and pay attention to the law and follow what the law says, okay? Okay, very, very good, Renee. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, go ahead, Michelle. Okay, so um, the piece that caught my eye was a was a piece in the business section, and I think it was Thursday. Um, Marla Dukaran, the chief economist for RBC, I'm not sure if it's a current position or past position. She was she was out there saying now that she believes that the Bahamas will have to be restructured or go through some restructuring with the IMF in the next year or two. Okay, and that's kind of scary. Now she's she's always in the paper. She's always over here. Um, you know, she's always one of the main speakers at big financial forums and whatever. And she had said that a couple of years ago, and at that time her prediction is that it would have happened by 2022, right? So we would have already happen. So now she's saying it's still probably going to happen. Um, it just needs. It probably will happen 2022, 2023. And she's basing that on the fact that she she doesn't think the Bahamas GDP. Um, it's going to grow enough. And so what she's putting out there essentially is that could mean um, the big D, the devaluation thing, or um, raising taxes. And I just thought, hmm, that's interesting because there is an, a, an, an economist, or however you say it, um, putting out a very different story than the government here is sort of trying to spin. So that's right. my and yeah, so like you said, she's been in the news quite a few times and she always makes these predictions and she always gets a lot of backlash from her predictions. Um, I, what I want to say is that with the IMF, there were a hundred countries that had to borrow money for the pandemic. We were not the other one, only ones. And, um, you know, we're kind of in line with what ha what's happening around the world with every other economy and how they are suffering from the pandemic. So I am surprised that of all the Caribbean countries, you know, some that are doing worse than we are, that she continuously points us out. Well, um, she's, what she was saying that is she was expecting the Bahamas to have to follow what Barbados has just done, actually. You mean in, in terms of being becoming a, was it them that became a republic? Yeah, they became a republic, but it sounds like they had to do some fiscal restructuring. And I don't know enough about what they've done to know if they raised their taxes or what well, they've done. Well, well, years ago, first of all, um, of course, you know, we were known as a tax jurisdiction for many, many years, a tax haven. And so laws are in effect, CRS and FACA, um, we are reporting to other jurisdictions. So of course we lost a lot of, you know, um, business in our offshore areas because it, if you have to pay the same tax that you have to pay at home, you might as well keep your money at home. Could somebody mute their mics, please? Yeah, so the only way the government makes money is through, through taxes and natural resources, or they are the two um, primary ways. And so Barbados, um, they have... Can we mute our mics, please? Let me, let me see if I can mute them. So we just stop hearing all this background talking, what's going on at home. Well, one second. Yeah, so um, yeah, Barbados has a slew of um, taxes, income tax, uh, 
state tax, or also or almost as bad as America and Canada, you know, that they get between 15 and 35 percent from their um, citizens. And so Barbados, I think, implemented recently, like say 2017, 18, an income tax. And so um, for a very long time, um, even though we updated our laws um, internationally, they're still saying that we don't have a corporate tax structure in place. Um, even though we do collect taxes from, um, you know, business um, entities, they do pay some business license fees and it depending on their revenue. So they don't want us to be more competitive. They don't want our jurisdiction to, to be more competitive. And then they also want us to, to stop borrowing so much. And the way for us to stop borrowing is to generate revenue. And so just having that is not sufficient. Now, I support taxes 100%, but when I need to go to the hospital, I don't need to sit up in PMH for three hours or three days before I'm served. And I want it to be clean and I want them to have all the supplies. You know, when I drive on the road, I, I don't want the potholes. When I send my, I don't want to have to pay school fees. I want to send my children to school and not be in fear of them getting killed, right? And so if, Indeed, we do put all these um, tax structures in place um, and we apply them to where they are supposed to go, then I have no problem with it. But yeah, I think the, the one of our problems is applying them to the right, um, I hate this consolidated fund thing that they always talk about. So if we apply it properly, then I support it 100%. But Barbados, like I say, um, a lot of persons just simply moved. You know, I was at the Royal Bank and we had a location in, in um, Barbados and the expats basically said, listen, it's too, it's too costly. It's too, too expensive to live there um, with all the different income taxes that they have. I think it's just us and Trinidad that have the lowest um, tax rate within the Caribbean. And so, it has to do with it. She is right in some aspects, but um, you know our government feels that she always, you know, speaks out against us for some reason. Whilst it's it's we are in line with most other countries. Okay, so good. We go, Michael and Owen. You all want to add something to that? Uh yes. What happened is is that uh, two articles stuck out to me in the Thursday's Tribune. One was um, the sale of the beach towers at Atlantis to another buyer and also the close down of the Hilton Hotel um, in downtown now. So those two stuck out to me. Um, okay. Yeah, so is it, a, is it a sale of the beach towers or is it a new location that they are adding? I, I didn't get that there was a sale. There was a sale? Yeah, so was, they are on renovating the beach towers. Okay, and so is this a sale with Pharrell? Because they did say that they're going to create yes, a new tower. Yes, ma'am. I didn't think it was a sale. It sounded more like a management agreement where he was going to take the beach towers and turn it into um, the somewhere else brand, which I think is his brand or with the yeah, other guy. another brand. It was really another brand basically a takeover. Say, for example, say the Hilton was transferred over to Marriott or something like that. I think it was a transfer of a brand. Yeah, it was a brand management deal, I think. But, but it's, it's good because the beach tower probably of all the Atlantis Towers needs a little uh, refresh, you know? It, but I'm it, wondering it, it, if it they does. could actually do that because they're talking about if that's the Hilton, that's what you were speaking to um, Owen, right? If that's the Hilton, that's 150 plus let go. It was two, it was two um, articles that I spoke to. There was um, transfer of the brand from the Beach Towers and then the Hilton is a separate article as well where they're, where they're closing down. Yeah, and but are we surprised? Are we surprised about the Hilton? I mean, look at my no, mom. They no, put mom, the point at all. Listen, I feel like I feel like once the once the what's that hotel's name? The, the Margaretville, right? Once yes. that opened up, I think that became more of an attraction and gave the the what is the Hilton, Hilton a, a bit of a competition because I honestly feel like they haven't renovated the Hilton in what over and what yes. time? Right. So I mean, let's be honest. Can, let's do like a little um competition if you would say first would be more attracted to the margaritaville because why wow, you have the pool area i think they said that's really nice on that side i haven't never seen it 
And then you have the different various restaurants and so forth versus the British colonial where it's like, okay, for that old formal base type of hotel setting, if you would say more, more or less from the 1960s, like they haven't changed their appearance in a few years. So I think that's that a factor. Yeah, yeah, and simply because it's new. And if, the, if right. think about it, will you pay to go in a 10 year old hotel versus a new hotel if the big Exactly. Somebody? Yeah, so simply because it's new. People like new things. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I wasn't definitely. surprised. Um, normally, like when I was to Royal years ago and they said Trinidad was purchasing us, they said, of course, there's not going to be any job loss. And two years later, job loss, branches closed or whatever. So they always save the doom and gloom um, um, report for later on. Oh, we didn't know. Um, it, it's just it's beyond our control. No, of course. When you saw Margarita Bill, if they didn't um, include it and renovate it, I, I, I knew it would not last. So I don't know why. But Ms. Price. Ms. Ballard, Ms. Ballard yes. if I heard correctly, I think they said the same person that, um, that owns the point owns um, Hilton also. The Chinese bought it. Yeah, that's correct. CCA. Yeah. yeah, so I, I guess I just want to give it a facelift and Hopefully, they afterwards they may hire the person back. That would be good. They didn't say they were going to hire them back. They said their jobs would become redundant, basically. Wow. They're, hiring, they're firing 150. My problem See? with that is you need to talk to the oh labor union before and the government before you do that. So I don't see how you are closing your doors before proper format is taken. That's my issue. Well, again, the enforcers who are the enforcers, the government needs to ensure that the laws are enforced. I also agree because I think they didn't even give the proper notice to even say, you know, they're closing within, you know, 60 days or so far. They're doing it literally in weeks. So that, that was pretty shocking as well. Well, again, the government, who, who are the enforcers, have to ensure that the people are protected. They, they can't go far. Margarita Will is right there. They, they can't escape. So, you know, I'm sure they will be dealt with. So no worries with in that regard. It's not like they are leaving the country and packing up shop. Whatever the Hilton closer, the Margarita will face. And I'm sure they don't want that reputation of us. Okay, so 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 very good, very good um, of keeping informed. Okay, um, Labashti, you wanted to share? And then we'll have Mikhail and Renee. Renee, I'm not certain if they will let, face let, the fine. Let, is, is let they large. going to fine? If they don't comply, then yes, definitely they will face a fine or some repercussion. So I, no worries when it comes to stuff like that. The labor board is um, very good at making sure that you know these very large companies do what they ought to do. Hi, Ms. Ballard. Hi. Um, can, can I share on um, the dirty, that's HSBC? I this would is, like to, who is this, Labashti? This is Justine. No, after they're done. After the person, yeah, 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 because we're going to talk about that. Yeah, we will. Oh, it's my, it's my turn. Navashti, yes, it's your turn. Oh, okay. So the article that stood out to me was actually in Tuesday's business section. It was talking about the Bamsi project. Um, I think the new minister, uh, Senator Young, he said that he wants to revive the project. I think actually it kind of collapsed a little bit before the pandemic, and. He said basically with the rising cost of food, items not hitting its new high, he thinks that he thinks that it would just be more of a an opportunity to invest into the pro project as it was before and try to start to educate our younger Bahamians, seeing as though there are many of, of young Bahamians that are now out here that are struggling to find employment. Um, they can now learn about the farming industry and try to invest themselves into it and try to bring this project to life. So that the Bahamas is not so dependable on outsourced goods, seeing as though we are also experiencing shipping costs and you know longer shipping time and all that on food products. So I thought that was interesting, and and it would definitely be something to help restructure the economy, you know, on food produce and and what's not. And um, also he said that it it will also help the lower income families to be able to have more of a healthier option of food. You know, seeing as though fruits are now at its all time high. I saw the other day that strawberries are now at fifteen dollars, I think. And yeah, I, I I thought that to be, you know, a a good a good turn that the country can look forward to. 
Okay, and so what makes it attractive though? Like, is that the major problem? We have the land. What will now make farming attractive to, um, you know, is a lot of hard work. Um, farmers are online saying that their laws need to be put in place because persons are breaking into their farms, stealing their goods, and there's no repercussion unless they pull out their guns and deal with them themselves. Okay? That is, that and is mar true. marijuana is coming online. If we can't oh, keep yes, people... I did, I did see that. Yeah, so we can't keep the people from stealing mangoes and being prosecuting them. How who would be mm -hmm. the security for these um um what the ganja fields? Who 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 who, 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 who man them? I think most definitely that would be where the new senator would have to now now put into place a board that would be in control of that because it would go it would go haywire if you know it really yeah. goes into full production yeah. and nothing is in place to stop it. And especially with food being so hard to purchase for most. They are definitely now resort to, you know, stealing because, I mean, we all have to eat. Yeah, but think about it. All these people who are on the side of the road selling canap and juju and all. Yeah, do they have fields somewhere? Right. Do they um, have fields? Are the farmers no, coming no, out no, and no, these are their salespersons? No, mom, they, they, oh. they, they, they're going okay. to someone's yard for that. Okay, so there you go. So, uh, you know, uh, we have to make it attractive. Um, we are not used to hard work. Uh, by the sweat of our brow and so they have to find an innovative way to to make it attractive and and more um um uh, you know get people more interested in in that very hard work and then put the laws in place to protect because we take it like if we walk past somebody yard and the pair hanging over the road we think that's our pair right and we go and take it in and don't even think about it twice so Most definitely, I think what would make the the industry so attractive is if they if they're paying, you know, for the hard labor. I don't think Bahamas would have a problem with working for what they're supposed to be paid. Yeah, okay, so with well, we but like I said, we need some like-minded people to get together and advocate for these things. Okay, okay, I want to go back to Vanika, but thank you so much, Lavasti, for sharing very You're interesting. You're welcome. Um, Vanika, what you don't understand is the management, why are the same persons, why would they be redundant? They will be redundant because some of these people have been there for more than 12 years. Like on the private, in the private sector outside of the hotel, you get a redundancy package up to 24 years. You get a month's salary if you're in management for every year that you have been. And if you're in um, entry level, you, you get two weeks salary. And so I think the hotels had um, negotiated that to be, and you get paid up to 12 years. So they simply don't want to pay, um, carry over those benefits. So if I am Ms. Bullitt, who done been here for 20 years, she has that benefit. And then I will have to pay out should she become redundant. You know, and the hotel is seasonal, you know, and the, they got a big slap from the, um, um, the pandemic and so not only do they have um you know years of salary owing to them they probably have pensions they probably have a medical plan and what have you in the new hotel there simply does not offer that and so you can't just take these people who would have had these plans for 20 years and invested their money and say but we don't offer insurance anymore and we don't offer the pension right and so they don't want to take over that cost and so it's cheaper to not pay them out yeah and so that's why they become redundant because to keep them is more expensive thank yeah. you yeah okay um Mikhail, you want to share oh uh, yeah good afternoon everybody so I, I just wanted to respond quickly to i think it was michelle's um story on miss jukaran i just wanted to add to that i saw where she was citing um similar to what you said about us borrowing those extra US dollars for the reserves. I think it's also important to note that when we talk about devaluation of the Bahamian dollar, because like our dollar is not, um, it being pegged, it is pegged to the US dollar. So it's not like a true reflection of the value of the Bahamian dollar. So for us, a lot of our purchasing power is tied to the reserve. So it's more, in my opinion, a matter of being able to keep the reserves afloat and again, that borrowing of that extra money was just like you said, to get us through that rough patch in the pandemic. So the fact that our dollar is overvalued, I think that's that's almost not a scare tactic, but it's not like the full story. So I think it's important to take that into consideration. Um, so 
just another story that I saw too that was somewhat interesting in, in a similar vein of, um, I guess, with the Hilton closing down. Um, uh, what's, what's the cruise line called? Crystal Cruise, um, that new all Bahamian destination uh, cruise line that, that was really popular at the beginning of the year. I think some of the newscasters and stuff went on like um, on, on small trips to kind of show how it was supposed to function. Um, well, actually, their parent company um, in Hong Kong just filed for bankruptcy. So that has actually been suspended, I think, up until April of this year, tentatively, depending, I guess, on how things go. So that's just another, I guess, example of how volatile the tourism product is. Um, I know that they had spent uh, some monies, too, as well as in terms of upgrading infrastructure on the outer islands, I guess, for those for the cruise ship to port. So a lot of people were looking forward to that as another boost to the economy. But I guess that is something that is now, quote unquote, suspended. Hopefully it does come back online really soon. But again, just another example of how volatile or susceptible to shock tourism is here. And very, very good. But Mikhail, with that, um, I think the US actually intervened or caused them to go bankrupt because, um, we talk, okay, when the cruise lines leave from here and go to the other islands, well, first of all, during the pandemic, um, the U.S. could not get approval to open up the cruise lines um, because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then the Bahamas government went into agreement and said, hey, listen, you can leave from here. So when right. they left from here, that meant 7,000 people would be catching a flight into the Bahamas perhaps staying overnight, because if you ever go on a cruise, you would know that you need to stay at least overnight in Miami for at least a night. Some, some people stay a week before they go on the cruise just to be prepared. And right. so the amount of money that you make in those two nights, you know, and, and you know, Bahamas are flying back and forth, 7,000 people coming in, uh, loads of money to your economy. And so um, Mayor DeSantis out of Florida, who was the mayor or whatever he is of Florida, he um, was outraged by those um, ships leaving from Bahamas instead of from Miami. And so that was loads of revenue that he lost. And he was on news every day fighting and saying how unethical it was that they were suffering a pandemic and we are stealing their business and what have you. And so I knew it wouldn't last. In fact, he put so much pressure then they said this, the, the longest it could go on is for six months. Okay, so we made loads of money. But once um, the port of call is changed, that's billions of dollars um, attached to that. Okay, because you have to, even if you just catch a taxi, that's, that's revenue, catching a taxi from the airport to the port, you know, and more than likely you would spend overnight and spend buy dinner and go shopping. And so he advocated the entire time for those ships to come back to, um, to Bahamas. Port. Yeah, uh, and, yeah, and it happened it took to their port, yeah. So it happened before too, when, when um, Obama had um, relaxed the requirements on Cuba, where he allowed you know, Cubans to travel home and they, had, they took 21 ships from us. Okay, so we lost a lot of revenue. Um, this was one of the positives with Donald Trump. Immediately when he came into power, he closed back off all of those relaxations to Cuba. And so therefore those same 21 ships that Cuba may have gotten for a month, we got them back. So it is the bottom line is a money thing. So yeah, don't be surprised if you don't see it come back. Oh, definitely. But I mean, in the case of the Crystal Cruise, I think that they were supposed to be leaving from New York. And then I'm, I'm not sure where the next one was. But I know New York was one of the one of the um, departing ports. But um, yeah, like you said, it does come down to just where it is more affordable and who wants to get the benefit for what. Yes, yes. And like I said, the Santas, they, they lost millions of dollars in that six months and we made that million dollars. So um yeah, they, they, I'm sure they did whatever they could to, to make sure that that didn't happen again. But yeah. it, was, it was very profitable and it was good. People enjoyed going to the outer islands. Like I even wanted to go to San Salvador. Yeah, it was good while it lasted, so. Hopefully. Yeah, so if we could, you know, the big bad US, if we could stand up against them, hopefully we'll be able to get um, some of those. Um, we, I guess we'll still have the leave from the US and then go to San Salvador and Exuma and what have you. 
you know, just and so I, they don't make sure they shut it out. All right, so we don't. So we don't take everything. Yeah, in, in yeah, eye, in yeah they need that piece of the pie now. Yeah, that's what they it boils need that down piece to. Of the pie. Yes, yes. So very, very good, guys. I'm very excited. Everybody is informed. You know what's going on in our country. This, this is very, very um, encouraging. So very good. Definitely on the right track. Okay, so normally at the beginning of the class, we'll take the first half an hour just to go through the news articles and um, talk about, you know, what's happening. And then for the people that come, they give them an opportunity to not miss the lecture. Okay, so I see some hands. Um, Andre, Lisa, Tanil, Melissa, Justine, and Crystal. And then we'll move on to um, talking about the dirty money. Okay, so go ahead, Andre Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanted to share two articles that I came across this past week. Um, one was international news and one was um, national news. In national news, the Tribune had an article in the business section um, about our brothers and sisters in the Treasure Key Island, and in, in the island of Treasure Key, sorry. Um, after Hurricane Dorian, they're still um, struggling to get Abaco together. Um, they had saved, residents had saved $320,000 um, to give to the water and sewage to give them a new sewage system as they lost their sewage system during the storm. Um, water and sewage, the Water and Sewage Corporation have yet to accept. Um, um, the residents have found themselves pumping their sewage um, daily themselves, and it's been a strain on the, um, the residents of Abaco. Um, the difficulties that the water and sewage has encountered um, with give, um, giving them aid is the fact that um, after the storm, it took nine months for them to get electricity, and then along came COVID. So. Our brothers and sisters in Treasure Key are struggling. Um, and in international news, BBC um, News shared an article um, with Donald Trump um, being investigated for fraud. Um, <clears throat> he inflated the value of his assets in order to get loans from insurance, get loans and insurance and tax breaks. And the Attorney General in, in New York, Letitia James, is filing a lawsuit against him. Okay, and remember what we said last week, only poor people is going to jail, right? So he's going to find a way. Um, um, Nygaard had a, a criminal history dating back to, to, to 1970, and he's just gone to jail after all these years. And, and then they can say he's too old, and they probably going to let him at the jail, jail can't accommodate him. Okay, so yeah, follow it. And pay attention. Uh, of course, even on dirty money, there's a series about Donald Trump. So, and nothing has ever been done. So, if you have the right network, you have a lot of money, and he doesn't even have a lot of money. He just has clout, <laughs> and that works for him. He has that strong network. Okay, so very, very good, um, Andre Lisa. Um, Tanil, go ahead. Okay, it is con kind of connected previously to what one of my classmates said when they were talking about how Mr. Young from BAIC planned to kind of restructure it to make us buy or purchase more products from the Bahamian farmer versus going abroad. I read an article from the Tribune that where James Smith, he was the former central bank governor and ex-financial um, minister, he was stating that the Bahamas really has to do something to curve how much spending is going to happen. And he said, don't think, I thought it was very important when he said this, don't think you won't be affected. Every family in the Bahamas will be affected by the 7% information from the U.S. And that's due to their big shipping issues with happening now. No one can get their product in. So it's hindering them. And that cost is coming now onto the person who consume and we consume since we get like 90% of our products from away. Then he was also talking about that is going to be combined with the cost of rising, of cost rising in stores, like someone else um, spoke to the, to today, the and how, like, group of Roberts, <laughs> how he talked with last class, he already making his new profit on the 12% added to bread item basket, 
pocket items, but now he's also keeping his profit line by raising the prices even on other items, even though he has dropped it to 10, even though the government has dropped it to 10%. I thought that was very interesting and timely because it's telling you no matter what, you will see cost rise, whether you like it or not. And I also, I actually found this article kind of disturbing. I don't know other person's feel about it, if you read it or saw it. It was Mr. Bo, and I, he said he was, he is the Fidelity Chief Executive in Freeport. He made a statement and he was talking about how we're going cashless and checklist now. Um, and he was saying that if people are too lazy to switch, the lines really killed me, then it's your own damn fault. Don't complain. <laughs> Don't complain to us about the fees, meaning the banks and the financial institutions, when you could have switched, meaning that you have to switch to online banking and using credit cards and using ATMs instead of just coming in with, and using all your transactions. And he was using Freeport as a, an example, saying that because of the hurricane that just passed and recent um, economic strifes they were having, that that is what they're more using. So they're not coming into banks. So they're not incurring these type of costs that we're incurring. But I just found the language and the tone of the article to be very out there. I think he could have done it a little more softly. So of course, they were encouraged. Diplomatically. Yeah, it was just rude to me. The whole article to me was just saying like, oh, you're all dumb people. This is what we need to do. This is where the world is going. And I didn't, for me, it wasn't, it wasn't a good way to approach the, the issue. Okay, and see, they've, they've, they've talked about it a thousand moments, so they're fed up. And so you have to be very careful when you hold position, not to let your, what should I say, your tone come through, okay? And when you must be diplomatic in all your responses. Miss Fillard? Saying he is wrong, I mean, or he is right, but just always try to remember to be diplomatic in all your responses no matter where you are hi miss ballard frustrated. yes go ahead i don't think it was mr bo that made that comment if i i, I worked for fidelity and knowing him i will read the article again but i believe it was someone that worked at central bank that made that comment on february 12th yes if you're too lazy about something i'll read it again I, but I, I, I don't believe it was him that made that comment yeah, so whether it was him or the person that said, yeah, that yeah, that is wrong. Really, yeah, I agree that is that is yeah. and not get so, and, and you will be frustrated. And like you said, you talk about things till the cows come home and, and nobody listens. So it does frustrate the process. Um, we have talked about even before um, the pandemic with these hurricanes about sustainability and about. Um, importing 90% of the things or 99% of the things that we need about farming, about fishing, and, and nothing is being done. So again, we have to go back to the drawing board. How do we now make these people act? We've given them the knowledge. They have the understanding. Now they need the belief and they need to the act, okay, without getting frustrated. Okay. It's very, she was very, sorry for that. It was, it, was how they it. it looked like they added his comments to other people, uh, uh, Mr. Literal comments. So he was making comments, but yeah, it's probably a Mr. Terrell, Literal. Literal. Yeah, he's an inspector of banks, Charles Literal. Okay, well, that yeah. too made the yeah, but again, you, that's his, his segment. Right, and so for us, we want to take a break and be careful of our email adequate. Be careful of when we are upset, the right things. I, I normally write an email and have to walk away and come back a day later to calm down. You have to be diplomatic, okay? And it's not easy because we are all human beings, but take five minutes, walk away, check what you wrote and make sure you cannot see the attitude and you don't come across as fool, okay? And Shanae is saying they thought back was lowered and there's price control, just like when it's the hurricanes and they price gouge, price control comes on the TV and says, we are gonna find these people if they price gouge and nothing happens. The cream and the bread and the lumber is still expensive, the water still goes up, nothing happens, okay? So again, we have these laws in place. If nobody's acting upon them, they, they, they make no sense, okay? We have to be a, a more, 
proactive society, then reactive, okay? We need enforcers, we need lobbyists, we need people to advocate and hold these people's feet to the fire or nothing happens. Price control, you continue to come on and just say, we are aware of this going on and do nothing about it, okay? And about Abaco and Freeport and, and Dorian, we're gonna talk about it some more when we get to the IMF in, in chapter three, but what lesson have we learned? from this, okay? Um, it was top news, it was everybody's priority, everybody's donation was going to help Freeport and Abaco in, in 2019. It was top of the list. One year later, something even bigger than that happened, right? To the world, so people forgot about it. So what does this teach us? We need our own business continuity plan for our family, right? And we need to test it. And we need to ensure that we have a backup plan. And if the house should burn down, what do we do? If nobody has electricity and nobody has water, what do we have a plan? Can we afford a generator? Can we dig a well? Okay, we cannot depend on the government, especially when it's affecting the masses. Okay, so please write the plan for your family. This is where we go and what we do. When the house burn down, it is the scene the time to decide where we go or who can help us, or if we have backup money, okay? So planning helps. It won't stop the house from burning down. It won't stop us from not having electricity, but it will at least have, you know, we have an immediate plan. Um, um, where do we get clothes from? Where do we get food from? Where do we go the next day, okay? So please, please get your family's development plan and know that that's an important emergency today. Tomorrow something else could happen and people forget about you, okay? And that's what we learned from Hurricane and Dory. Okay, good. Crystal, go ahead. Okay, so I read an article, I think that was last week in the Tribune. Um, it says the Bahamas targets already out of 40 compliance. This one stood out to me because, you know, we talking about the FATF and the money laundering and all those things. And it, I think it's really impressive that out of the 40 recommendations, you know, we're complying with 38. And I think the two, they were saying the two that we weren't really compliant with was digital assets and nonprofit organizations. And I think to me, like soon we'll soon maybe be fully compliant because, you know, we have the sand all our digital currency coming out. You see a lot of people stop taking cash. Um, um, that's the airport, I think. They're going cashless. Bahamas says completely cashless. So it's, I guess it's looking hopeful that we would soon be fully compliant. And like you said, they were cracking down on all of these nonprofit organizations and all of these charities in the Bahamas, making them get registered. So that article stood out to me. Okay, and very good, Crystal, and very timely because we are going to talk about the 40 recommendations in this class and, and international standards. So so very good. And hopefully by the end of your class, everything that you read would have tied it. Okay, so very, very good um, people. And, and thank you for sharing. Um, we want to talk to Kelsey, is it? And Justine about Dirty Bunny because they took their time and they, they watched it. Right, Justine and Kelsey. Is it Kelsey? And am I calling the correct name? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So go ahead, ladies. Go ahead, Kelsey, and tell us. Tell us what you um watched in Dirty Money. I encourage everybody to watch the case on HSBC. And again, it's just awareness training. Um, it's just to show us that we can eliminate risk, or we can mitigate risk. We cannot eliminate it. Sorry. So mitigate. We can put controls in place to mitigate it, but we cannot um, eliminate it, okay? And so when we get into these positions, a lot of us, we take it so seriously. I, I know somebody had a heart attack, literally got stressed out and sick because the company was not following um, proper protocols, policy and procedure and was not being compliant. This is an eye opener to show you just how devious and unethical these um, um, persons are that you work with. 
and, and how you have to keep your eyes open and it helps you to, you know, create awareness to say, you know, you know, what am I really fighting against? Um, is this company in my appetite? Do I need to look for another job? Okay, so so go ahead, Justine, and tell tell Sam. You all there? Okay, who's going first? Yeah. Okay, you go okay, ahead. I'll go first. Okay. okay, yes, I did watch the HSBC. Um, it was very interesting and captivating um, the way that this major bank had laundered money for these drug lords or drug cartels and that nothing really came out of it. Nothing really came out of it. And what stood up one thing, there's a few things that stood out to me that the detective, whilst they were talking about the whole series and how the drug lords, how they move the drug and then how they get it into the banking system. And he was saying, you know, not to follow the drugs, follow the money. And then also the journalist, I think she was a Spanish journalist. She was saying that the intent isn't to kill persons or cause casualties. Like it, it's an accident if you get caught in the crossfire, but it is really the money. And I think it was Mr. Stern that came to work to HSBC and has a compliance officer. And he was the one that went to the police, I think, with what was going on there because his dream, his desire was to be a CIA and that didn't happen for him. So I guess because he has that desire, when he went there to HSBC, he noticed that something was wrong. Some, you know, the way they kept their records and just the way that things were functioning, he knew that something was wrong and he brought it to their police's attention. But what really got to me is like this major bank, like how they, like no one was arrested. No one was arrested. Um, it didn't matter that, you know, they were like, I guess, accomplished with these drug lords because, you know, and all the lives that, that were the people that were murdered and these persons were able to bank with them. And when the law, uh, when the light was shone, shone on them, like they, they just paid a fine, like no one was arrested. I wondered, is it because like, they had persons that they paid like bribery or, or is it because the government right. was, um, they didn't want um, for persons to lose their job or have such a high rate of employment because this was a major bank. See, um, remember now at the end, the attorney general, the US attorney general was promised a job. His time was up, the government was changing. He was promised a job in the law firm that represented him. And so therefore he turned a, a blind eye and he said, just slap them with a fine. And we so broke, right? Anytime somebody say billion, we, we say, because oh, somebody even um, played that part in a training and said, this was, this company was five, $1.9 billion. Okay. But if you know the inside story, they make that in five weeks. Yeah. So yeah they said they can make that like in two weeks. Yeah. yeah. So that's a slap on the wrist for them. But to us who broke, all we have to do is hey up $1.9 million and we say, oh God, that's the end of that bank. Not knowing because of the size of the bank, it was a joke for them, okay? So this is why you have to pay attention to the inside details. You need to know the full story. You need to know who the author is and who telling the story, who will give you the real you know, information, okay? So awareness. When you're too big to fail, we need to call people to go to jail, like tell you. Get your revenue streams intact. Only four people get it. Only four people pay bills. Yes. I believe if it was a smaller company, they probably would have arrested some person. Of course. Of course. If the attorney general wasn't, didn't need a job, wasn't going to retire, they would have been in jail. But he was going to um, no longer be the attorney general. They promised him a job and book. we forget about that case. Okay. Melissa, you want to add something? Thank you, Justine, for sharing. Melissa, you want to add? 
Yes, for the sake of time, the same things that stood out with Justine, with the whole fact that no one was arrested, um, they paid hardly or little to no fines. And then another thing, the compliance area. There was no no auditing of the compliance area. They had these persons there just for having sake, but there was no compliance being done. And so all those things got swept under the rug. So that was one of the things that stood out for me as well, in a yeah. nutshell. And, and we want to be careful. I have persons in my intro class saying that they are on the board of directors, okay? And they only have a high school diploma. I have persons in the intro class asking me if they have to go any further. Do I have to take ICA? I said, what's your position? I'm the CEO. I'm the MLRO. I'm the head of compliance. And you an intro? Okay. So be very careful of persons offering you positions that you are not qualified for. Okay, I'm not saying to turn it down, but what I'm saying is if you do get that position, get into class right away, get the training, network with people and upgrade yourself. No longer can you sit in these positions and not be qualified. When this is a red flag, when people hire you and say, here's the office, here's a cell phone, here's an allowance, here's a big salary, I just need you to sign. Be very careful of that, okay, because it's happening. I had a company say, Ms. Bullard, we'll pay you $100,000 a year. We just need you to sign. You don't even have to come from, to work. You could work for more. Because we know that you will be better than a group. Okay? So they, that's the type of offers that are being made. But you can go to jail. Okay? So if you know you're not qualified for the position, please don't take it. And that's any position. And if you do take it, get in class, network with people, and upgrade yourself. You cannot sit in that position not knowing because more than likely they're using you as a puppet okay so be very careful of that all right so very good y'all please watch it again it, it, it's a lot of awareness um a lot of things to learn and what can happen to you in these institutions and so of course you know we have our good behavior training where our parents gave us foundation we do not want to go into these institutions and compromise ourselves because we got school fee to pay or the mortgage to pay or, you know, we need this job. If the job is outside of your appetite, if they're doing things that are non-compliant, you must leave. And in order for you to comfortably leave, you need to have your other revenue streams. Make a job, try and think about it. You can bake cakes, bake cakes. If, if marijuana is coming along, if you have a piece of land and Annie and Andrews talk to her and say, let's get this field, let's get the security company going for all these marijuana fields that come in aboard. Because you can need like three police <laughs> or, or out on them fields to make sure people don't be out there stealing marijuana. Correct? Okay, so do your research and, and, and get it done. All right, so very good, very good. I'm very excited. We, are, we know what's going on in our country. We know what the headlines are. And we can have um, lively discussions. So, so, so very good class. I'm, I'm very pleased um, with the in interaction um, today. So good. I hope persons had the opportunity to read chapters three and four, two or three pages. Very, very light. Um, and we should now know about international standards and um, the laws that go along with them. And so in terms of how um, it works with these international standards, um, there are international bodies who are considered the international regulators. And that's the FATF, which is the Financial Action Task Force. It's the OECD, Organization of Economic um, Development. Um, the Wolfsburg Group, they deal with correspondent banks. Uh, they are the largest banks um, in the world, Deutsche Bank, Wells Fargo, Chase Bank, they come together and they make, um, they have a committee that puts in um, rules and regulations in regards to correspondent banking, that's the Wolfsburg Group. Then the Basel Committee, um, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. And so you should have heard all these names, the UN. And um, these are the international regulators, okay? so. Each of these international regulators, you know, they, they govern the world. Um, I think there's about 195 countries 
that roll up under these international regulators. So because it's so many countries, they have various jurisdictions. So there's a Caribbean jurisdiction, there's an Asian jurisdiction, there's a European jurisdiction. So of course the Bahamas would be in the Caribbean jurisdiction. So we roll up underneath the CFATF, okay? And so um, the FATF was established in, in 1989. Um, its purpose is to establish international standard and develop and promote policies, both national and internationally, to combat money laundering and financing of terrorism. Okay, it's housed in Paris, um, in the office of the um, OECD. Um, they meet several times a year to bring together legal, financial, and law enforcement experts from over 30 um, countries. This is very popular. What is this mandate? What are its tasks? Its mandate is reviewed every um, five years, um, the latest being for eight years until 2020. So the FATF assesses the implementation and effectiveness of systems designed to combat money laundering and terrorist financing. So they set international standard, they monitor compliance with the, these standards that they set, they promote um, application of the FATF standard through FAC. TF style regional bodies like the Caribbean region encourages compliance of non, um, non FATF members with FATF standards and they study methods and trends of money laundering and terrorist financing. So the question normally asks what are their tasks? They set the standards, they monitor them, they promote them, they encourage the compliance with the non FATF members and they do studies. Okay? And so again, how it works, international bodies, FATF, OECD, Wolfsburg, UN, Basel Committee. Each country then has a regulator for their industry. The central bank is the regulator for banks. The Securities Commission is the regulator for the securities um, companies and the broker dealers. Uh, the Compliance Commission is the regulator for the real estate um, brokers, the accountants and the lawyers that have a financial services arm. So not the criminal lawyers that out every day um, for theft and murder, but the Higgs and Johnson, um, um, the Deloitte and Touche that offer corporate service uh, to clients, okay? Those, those types of firms. Um, the insurance commission, of course, um, regulates the insurance companies and the gaming board um, regulates the gaming houses as well as you know the casinos at Bahama and Atlantis. Okay, so international standard and the international standards. Um, the FATF um, came up with forty recommendations that they recommended countries should follow. Okay, and like um, who was it that spoke on? Who, who was it? Let me. See. I can't remember who just said they read the. Uh, you know, article about us being compliant in 38 of the 40 recommendations. That was Mima Polo. Right, right. Very good, Crystal. Crystal said that she just read that we are compliant in, in 38 of those 40 recommendations. And so um, they call them recommendations. However, if countries do not implement them, what happens to us? Does anybody know? On a, on a block. I think it's a blacklist. Or a a blacklist, right. Very good to me. And if we don't put these, it's right. we recommend that you do this. But if you don't, you get blacklisted. Okay. So um, let me just share my screen. And let's see if we can pull up these recommendations. Um, um, one question. Yes, go ahead. Um, I, I have an idea what the blacklist is, but... Um, if you could reiterate to me some examples of what um what are the disadvantage or the, the disadvantages of being on the blacklist? Okay, so of course when investors want to do business with you, they will not um they look at your country's risk rating, they look at whether you are following international standards. And remember, these standards are to combat money laundering and terrorist financing. So they're not going to invest with you because they don't feel that you have sound um, um, framework or structure in place to protect their investment against money launderers, okay? Uh, your country suffers reputational risk. 
Um, most countries you will find that they don't do business with high risk countries, right? And so if, you're, if your risk rated is high, they simply don't do business with you. Okay, so there are lots of benefits to ensuring that, um, you, you know, if you're blacklisted, countries want to avoid being blacklisted. Um, your credit risk, if you're you are high risk, um, that requires enhanced due diligence. And so that's way more work and way, way more expense. And then just like credit ratings, um, if you have a low credit rating, we can give you a low interest rate. But if, if you have a high credit rating, um, the risk to do business with you is higher. And so we need to charge you 10% versus 5% if you're low risk. Okay, so is the countries are, are concerned about um, being blacklisted. And so on the screen, does that answer your question, Owen? Uh, yes, it does, yes. thank you. Okay, good, good. And so let me just give you an example. Um, we have complained over the years that many times we would have implemented the um, recommendations. However, you know, both governments, PLP and FNM, Ryan Pinder as well as um, Turn Grass felt that, you know, the more we put in place, um, the more regulations and standards that they come up with, because essentially we were the competition. And so therefore they were trying to wipe us out. Nevertheless, you know, these standards were rolled out to the entire world, right? And so countries around the world had to implement you know, it, nobody was more competitive than the next. So like I said, in the first class, you know, the Bahamas took a staggered approach because regulation is expensive. Training is expensive. Compliance makes no money for the business. And so therefore to go and buy a million dollar system to track the uh, um, transactions or track the names, you know, um, companies did not want to make that investment, right? And so the company uh, with these 40 recommendations, Remember, compliance was born in 2000 when um, we were blacklisted the first time. And so we put in the shell of these recommendations, but a lot of um, things were missing. They could not hold up in court. If you hired Ducille or Wayne Monroe, you could bend on a technicality. And so from these recommendations, we, there was a um, mutual evaluation in 2017 that told us exactly where we were deficient and what we needed to do to update. So I just want you to have a look at, at the screen. This is the 40 recommendation, just so you would see how it looks. Um, very important when you're reading legislation or um, any guideline that you look at the date, you see this says is updated in 2019. Um, if you go into Google and you Google 40 recommendations, the first one comes up is the 2003 version. And all the recommendations and the numbers and everything has been updated since then. So before you start, I had somebody write an entire paper, 3,000 words on an old regulation. So please check the date. And then as you can see in the corner here, this is 134 pages. Ms. Bullard, we can't read all these pages, right? We will fall asleep. And so what you do is you go to the, the table of contents and you just search you know, for whatever topic that you are looking for. Okay, and again, this is just for awareness training. Um, we look at recommendation one. It says assessing risk and applying a risk-based approach. Okay, and we'll talk about that, I think in chapters five or six about risk-based risk -based approach. Okay, and so we were deficient in, in, in recommendation one. Okay, we did not enforce that risk-based approach. And so um, basically recommendation one says countries must assess their risk and then put controls in place to protect the country against the risk. That's how, that's it right there. That's basically what it says. So risk assessments were made mandatory for all financial institutions in, in um, June of 2019. So there was an AML risk assessment that was required. And then in October, there was a, a enterprise wide where each um, um, department would have to complete a risk assessment, which means Finance had to do an assessment. HR had to do an assessment. Credit had to do an assessment. And then you collate all of that information and you, you send it in as the enterprise-wide risk assessment. So risk assessment first for AML and then one for the entire organization. 
okay? And so we were deficient in recommendation one because this was not up to force. Okay, and so again, these were, came out in 2003. Um, for, in fact, um, they were updated in 2012 and then again updated in 2019. So all the numbers and everything changed around and as events happen, like hurricanes and, and stuff and pandemics, they, they updated to, to make sure that um, they covered. So that's why you wanna look at the table of contents and ensure that you have the correct version and, and just search for what you are looking for. In the 40 recommendation, you will notice as you, pay, you know, look at it closely, you will see from recommendation um, nine or 10, it talks about customer due diligence straight to 24, okay? So that's the most of the recommendations. That's what 40 and recommendations are the 40 deals specifically with preventative measures and customer due diligence. Okay, so that, that's just, again, like I say, for awareness. Um, any questions so far? Are we familiar with the 40 recommendations? No, we good, Claire's mud. Okay, so again, it's international standards. Then countries put these recommendations into laws. And then the regulators then establish guidelines. So you would find that these, re we're gonna talk about laws in the next chapter, but you would see that each of these 40 recommendations, we break it down into layman's terms and, and we put it into a guideline. So just like the 40 recommendation talks about um, a risk-based approach, we looked at um, um, risk, countries must implement a risk-based approach and put controls in, um, identify the risk, put controls in place to mitigate those risks. We see in the central bank guideline, again, we wanna look at the date to make sure it's the most current version, August 2018, and then risk. Risk self-assessments, um, risk rating of customers, developing a risk framework, and then risk assessment should be in here somewhere, okay? And this would give you a guideline more in layman's terms, more geared toward the industry. So the, I just use the central bank because, you know, um, it's been around longer than the Securities Commission and it's the oldest regulator. And so they have more, um, they're more up to date with the practices. And so um, the Securities Commission have their guidelines and their rules for AML. So does the Compliance Commission. They have codes of practices and what have you that you must follow and then the gaming board. So it just depends on where you are in the financial services sector. You should know what your regulator requires, okay? And so all of that would be implementation of those 40 recommendations into Bahamian law, then into guidelines. And then from your guideline, your organization should have an AML policy that just pulls out um, what is specific to you, okay? So if we don't offer um, foundations, then there's no need for our internal policy to talk about trust accounts and foundations, okay? Or segregated accounts companies, or we don't deal with power of attorneys. So therefore you don't need to include that in your internal um, AML policy, okay? And it's checked. Um, the other day, the regulator basically told us, go have the law inclusion confirm that everything that's in the central bank line, your AML policy includes, and make sure that they identify any deficiencies. Okay? So that's how these standards are um, implemented into Bahamian law and then guideline to each regulator. And so after we had had them for what, 18 years? Is it 18 years? Okay, here it is. This is what I want. They came in and they did a mutual evaluation report, right? And what they did in this mutual evaluation part is this is where they tell us which ones that we are deficient in. And again, this report is 157 pages. You go directly to the table of contents and you look look you, you know look for what you're looking at. And they have each one of the 40 recommendations listed there. And in their key findings, they tell you 
The Bahamas is still completing its money laundering carers financial um, financing national risk assessment, the NRA, and has yet to develop a documented national AML CFT policies. There's a reasonable understanding of money laundering terrorist financing risk among competent authorities in the Bahamas on account of the NRA exercise. There's a need for this understanding to be placed in, in the context of the Bahamas as an international financial center and for it to be shared with relevant stakeholders, which is the whole entire financial services sector. Measures also need to be taken to mitigate these money laundering risks. A good foundation for national coordination and cooperation at national level has been established through the task force. Okay, so what the Bahamas did is created a task force because the country's um, risk assessment first have to be in place. And so that means the Compliance Commission has to talk about the real estate, the law firms and the account firms. The Central Bank has to say what's happening in the banking industry and the, uh, in the credit unions and the money services businesses. The insurance commission needs to say what's happening in the insurance um, areas, okay? And you need to compile all of that and make an entire risk assessment for the Bahamas, okay? And you just from saying that, that, that make me tired, just saying all of that. So that's very extensive work. And that's only recommendation one. Okay, and so the only way central bank can come up with what's going on in the industry is each bank in the industry, each credit union, each money services business have to submit their um, risk assessment. I think it's, it's 4,000 in total. So once they get all that information, they send out surveys, they ask you questions, then you submit it and then they can um, come together with the task force and put information in place for the country as a whole. It's very important that right now we are uh, rated as medium high, but the last time this risk assessment was done was in 2014 and it's gravely deficient because we have just regulated gaming in 2015. We have just regulated law firms, accounting firms and real estate in 2019. So everybody's on a learning curve and scrambling, trying to get all this information into the regulator so we could present our risk assessment as a whole to the FA, to the Basel Committee that risk rate countries are Transparency International. Okay, and that's just recommendation one. So we see how extensive it is. So we've done loads of work since 218 to be compliant in 38 of these 40 recommendations. Okay, any, any questions so far? You're too quiet, you'll have to talk back to me because you all already read this and you all know what Miss Bullet talking about. Talk, it talk back to me, please. Bullet. Sorry? I said we're taking it all in. You're taking, but are you all understanding? Are you all hearing me? Are you all going to yeah. retain this? You all understand not what I say? Loud and clear. A lot, it's this a lot to digest, I mean. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I would agree with that too. It is a lot to take in. <laughs> it might be small, but can you clarify to me what makes the Bahamas like a financial center? I know it might be a little bit off, but I saw it some, like in the readings, some of the readings we had, but I didn't know why we were put as a financial center or what makes us that. Okay, because. so when you... um look at a country, um, there's something called a value proposition, like what makes your country attractive, right? And why do people come here, right? And so our value proposition is, of course, sun, sand, and sea, right? And then um, a financial services center. So before this regulation came out, 80% um, was tourism. Um, and the next 20% was financial services, right? And because we were seen as a tax haven that made us very attractive to the outside world. I don't have to pay taxes in my country. Um, Bahamas had secrecy laws. I could just deposit my money into the Bahamas and nobody would ever know. And my country would never know because it's cheaper to deposit. It was cheaper, I should say to deposit your money into the Bahamas, 
then to pay taxes in, around the world, just like you talked about Barbados earlier, taxes are between 15 and 35%. And very rich people do not like to pay taxes because they feel like governments are, are very unscrupulous. So if they were, like I say, investing it into the schools and into the roads, into the hospitals, they would mind. But these governments, they build a big house. They travel it on a private jet. They drive around in the government car, picking their children up from school. So they don't, they don't believe in paying taxes. So they found a way around. And it was not only Obama, it's like Switzerland, Cayman, where you could deposit this money and not pay. Think about 15%, 30% of 10 million. You know, that's a lot of money. It's cheaper to pay $10,000 in fees each year and save $100,000. And so that's what made us attractive. Um, go ahead, Owen. Okay, to, to, to piggyback on what you said, I have a, I, I, I don't know if I understand this question too correctly. As we talk about the Stafford Sands, you know, um, it is always said that it was him that had made an, uh, a move that caused our dollar today to be worth on the same par with the U.S. dollar. But then they said that he was there to do the talk about the tourism and making it a year-round industry. What really was it that caused that the Stafford Sands did to cause our dollar to be on par with the U.S.? That's my question. I would have to research that, Owen. I, I mean, I have a lot of information, but to answer you um, correctly, we'd have to do some research. So perhaps you go online and I go online to speak, and next class we say exactly, because I don't like to get false information, okay? Thank but you. I know we have um, U.S. reserves, and, and it has to be maintained. There's a limit, and we've been good at the exchange control. And so to say specifically what he did, let me and you do some research this week and we come back and, and, and we share with the class next week. Is that good? Perfect, perfect. Yeah, okay, because like I say, Ms. Ms. I would be a crazy person. Um, how compliance works is you won't have all the answers, but you must be information seeking and you must know how to do research. And I think I said this last week, whatever research you do, you keep it, um, in a portfolio, you create your library, especially if you're going to go all the way to ICA, you're going to need that again. Okay, so um, keep that information um, organized. So every time you will be able to cut down the amount of research that needs to be done. Okay, uh, does anybody else know before we, we go and do this research? Anybody else know um, what the staff and science did? Specifically, no, no. Okay, nobody else knows off the top of the head. Yeah, but we we know where to go and do research, and so we will. Let me write that down. So in my notes, first of science. What did he do? Okay, good. And anybody else, feel free to chime in to our discussion next week as well. So please do your research. Okay, good. So um, we know about the FATF, we know about the task. We know that's a very popular question on the exam. Um, we know that the Bahamas is a part of the CFATF. And like I said, both governments feel that the more, you know, we are very small jurisdiction, but the UK and the US feels that, well, we were able to put the policies and procedures in place. Um, the, the U.S. in regards to taxes, because they knew how much money they would make. They, they, pay, they spent $18 million to upgrade the IRS to be able to collect um, um, information from jurisdictions around the world for FACA, F, you know, a foreign um, accounting tax regime. And so um, they, we spent $18 million, but the Bahamas is so much smaller and we, we definitely couldn't spend that type of money that would wipe us out, right? And so um, a lot of times, you know, we always threatened to be blacklisted. And so in May of 2018, when we were signing all of these agreements to share information in regards to taxes, we had signed um, all the T's the tax information acts with the various countries. We had sent this information to the OECD and 
apparently they have a technical team that receives information and they did not communicate to their um, decision-making body that we had sent in this information. And so subsequently we were blacklisted then. And so Peter Turnquist lashed out at them and said, they said, you all are trying to wipe us out as a smaller jurisdiction. You all are trying to be this majestic and thinking that we could have the money and the resources to implement all these systems and controls the way that you do. Um, you purposely blacklisted us. You caused us reputational risks and what have you. And so basically they said, um, well, they will no longer blacklist us, right? Um, they will allow countries to blacklist us. So what you have to understand is the same prime ministers and presidents from around the world, um, from Greece, from Switzerland, they, they have seen people that sit on, on, on these OECD boards and what have you. And so immediately after they apologized for blacklisting us in error, um, France then blacklisted us for something, the Netherlands blacklisted us, Germany blacklisted us. So we had blacklists coming that's right the center for various different reasons. Then the EU blacklisted us, right? And so um, what we found out if we don't have a seat at the table, you know, nobody advocates for the Bahamas. Nobody advocates and say, oh no, uh, let's check to see if they sent in their stuff or what they did. And so um, they had promised after they made that mistake that, that they would advise us first before they blacklisted us. And there was a team that was supposed to come in in May of 2020 to check to make sure that our 40 recommendations were indeed up to date and current. They were coming in, they said, I think with the FIU and with the central bank and the pandemic happened. And so they were not able to come. And so because they were not able to come to verify that we had indeed updated our laws in regards to taxes, we were blacklisted again, okay? And so Carl Bethel realized that, you know, if you don't have a seat at the table, um, there's nothing happened. So he is now the chairman of the FCFATF, which is the Caribbean region. And so therefore we have a seat at the table now. We also have another colleague who's the president of the UN, um, Ms. Bain, Kevin Bain, and we have somebody else out there internationally. So our country needs like like-minded people and future leaders. So again, we hope that this is just the beginning and that you're not afraid to go Glo go global. Of course, we see what's happening in our parliament now, and so we need strong future leaders and, and some that are going to go global and represent us. Because if you don't have a seat, yeah, a lot of things happen. Okay? Okay, that's the 40 recommendations and the um, CFATF. Um, any, any questions? No? Claire's mud, you're very quiet, you're scaring me. Okay, the IMF, and then I'm gonna call on some persons to give me some feedback, okay? Um, the IMF was established in 1945 as a specialized agency of the United Nations within the framework of the Bretton Woods Accord. The IMF was designed to avoid a recurrence of the problems of the Great Depression. Its focus was overseeing the international monetary system, preventing crisis by encouraging sound economic policies and providing short-term loans to help balance of payment problems for various countries. And so back to with the lady, you know, from Barbados, who was at Royal Bank, who was saying, you know, when the pandemic happened, a hundred countries had to borrow money from the IMF. Okay, it was not only the Bahamas. So they, you know, and we are very small jurisdiction. We have very large economies that still have to borrow. And, and nevertheless, we, we still can do better. Uh, we could be more fiscally responsible. We can um, um, do what we ought to do um, um, to stabilize our economy. Go ahead, Owen. Okay, I'm not going to answer no more questions. I'm sorry. No, to... Owen, this is interactive. Miss okay. my mouth is like talking too much. Um, this, is, talk back to this me. is connected to the IMF. Do you see us having to implement income, income tax within the near future? I mean, considering the fact that our deficit rate is so high and um, they're still borrowing? Yes, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Uh, the only, like I say, we can't get a hold on our, our natural resources. Um, the Hawksville Creek Agreement was just renewed for another 99 years when the PLP was in power. After they saw what happened to um, 
um, Freeport, for it, it's not been beneficial to the the economy or the people of Freeport. But we renewed that agreement for another ninety nine years in, in in benefit of the the port, right? And so we can't get this a ragged like thing under control. Um, when Ingram was in power, he got himself straight. So along with the company, I think it, it, they changed from um, Oceanic and they now made it uh, Ocean Key. Now you go there for a vacation, but they are still the Hollow West Coast are still the people that are managing it. Only them and Ingram could dig for a ragged night that make billions of dollars. Um, I don't think nobody, um, what do they, the Chick Chani plant that, that they may compare it with? We can't seem to get any of this, this money. You know, it goes to one family. We are supposed to be like a, a socialist nation, but we are more capitalist. It, it, every country has a national lottery. We gave it to eight persons. And now they are saying they made $550 million in, in one year. Why didn't the government make that? So we keep making the same mistakes over and over again. And so therefore, what other way are we gonna make money other than to tax the people? Okay, we have a big immigration problem. We have the same immigration problem that Canada has, but Canada does not call it a problem. They call it for people. In fact, the more people that you have in your economy, the more money you make, because you tax them. And so that's what, um, 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 Canada is doing. You go to live to Canada now. I, I had somebody move over there. They make $250,000. $82,000 goes to the Canadian government. But when they go to the hospital, they're served in a timely manner and it's clean. And, and they live. When you go to our hospital, you have to wait three days and hope you don't die because you know bad. Nobody to serve you. Or you sit out into the rain until you serve. You can't keep a tire because you're dropping a hot potato hole every three miles that you drive. You can't send your children to government school without the fear of them being killed. Okay? And so, therefore, we're taking all this money and buying these defense for a ship with the people who know how to drive and trying to protect a, a, a border that is too wide to be protected. The US couldn't protect it. Pitlin said this if the US couldn't protect their border with the CIA and the FBI, well, how are we to protect it? So why have we not learned and, and, and let the people come and tax them? But people can come to our country and the schools are filled with undocumented people, right? The hospital is filled. You can't turn them away and you can't lock them up at the hospital or church. Tax the people, do what Canada has done and, and, and they are striving. Stop wasting money trying to protect the border put the system in place and, 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 and document them. Nowhere in the world you could go and build a shanty town and have electricity and all these things. You can't do that in Canada. Don't think you go into Canada to build a shanty town and, and, and live. You can't do that. So we have the fix what we can't control. Okay? And so the only way to make the money to get the natural resources under control, stop signing these ridiculous agreements for 99 years that's in benefit of one person or one company and not the people. And tax the foreigners because you can't control them. Every day you're spending money to repatriate these people. No, regularize these people and put them to work. Tax them. They have to eat in Canada no matter what you do. Even if you go to Canada for a better way of life and you leave your wife and your children here, 50% of that money staying in the, in, 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 in the government or going back. You have to eat, you have to live, you have to pay rent, you, are, you know, and you will be taxed. But if you look at us, the money services businesses, cash and go out the door. Western Union out the door, the money going out the country as fast as it coming and no tax. So. They can live on, like the Chinese, live on 20%, they save 80%. They send 80% back to China for the next Chinese family to come. The Africans, the Jamaicans, that's what they do. They send the money back out the country. So we have to put, learn from Canada. That's what we do. We copy what other countries do well. 
Miss Bullet. Yeah. Um, speaking on how you say tax the finance, I agree because one of my coworkers she had to send her son to Barbados when they was at school. They were both were doing school, and for him to go to the public school, she had to pay like he went to private school. So for me, when I heard that, I was like, "Oh, why we don't do that?" You know, tax we them. Don't have no if, sense. We have a bunch of educated people in the government. I mean, they are clear examples all around the world. And then do you see them uneducated people raising up children just to go and take their place. So we have the same players for the last 50 years. We need future leaders. We need to upgrade ourselves. We need people who are ethical. We need people who want to make a difference and who have sex oh, and can get out this clogged up system. Ms. Bullard, I think yeah. a part of the problem too is like when, when, when we talk about income tax, some people get scared is not inherently a bad thing. Because like if you think about how much we spend in terms of duty and now VAT, we, we, we spend a considerable amount in taxes. But if, it were, if you were to switch the tax structure, to switch the tax structure to something like income tax, a lot of wealthy people would be impacted too. And one thing right. about wealthy people, they don't want to be parted from their money. So, of course. So if That's the, the biggest are, problem. They're the ones who are blocking Congress and right. all these people, right? So because exactly. the money and will come the from them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's almost like spinning your wheels because the people that you need to help the country overall, they don't want to take that loss. So it's mm -hmm. sort of like, sorry, you poor, but yeah, I don't have I mean, nothing to do with us. Right, right. And they hate insurances and they hate governments. Because, right. I mean, governments do go and spend the money, scandalously. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when the PLP came along, but let's reduce, we could reduce um, um, VAT for a year. Listen to me. Our great grandchildren could stop uh, be paying for this. But again, they couldn't That's even fun. do it. You see what they do? They had to take off the bread basket <laughs> items. And then they come with this ridiculous, but only 42%. 42% is almost half of the people that use the bread basket items. So what, the heck, what are you talking Listen, about? Listen, I said that was the most cyclical, non moving forward policy I've ever heard. I was like, all of this shucking and jiving and we, we have not moved one step further. No, no, because Rupert, they knew Rupert would go up and uh, there's no real price control. And, and so the people are paying double. And, and, and this, this, this makes no sense. There was no way by 2024, we were supposed to increase back to 15% because again, it's international standard that we are following. You know, and so they come up with this stupidity on the campaign trail and people believe them. This is how the country pays this bill. This country is in a deficit. There's no way you could reduce anything. And for now, one year would, would cause us to have to pay it back for 10. And what is one year anyway? This so is I, 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 yeah, this, this is wild. Is because see, that's just it. Mikhail, there are more grassroots people than educated people who understand how economies work. Okay, and so they feed on our people die. The Bible is telling you the people die, die from a lack of knowledge, right? So if the Bible said that, what would it be? Well, here we are. Okay, so that's that's it. The campaign trail foolishness, and now we suffer. Just and just to say, we we did. I think we got five million dollars from the game and how to say? <laughs> yeah, when they made five hundred and fifty million, five hundred and fifty million. You get five million. What is that? One percent? Is that one percent, Owen? Okay, um, I'm not good in math. I got to get okay. my calculator. <laughs> okay, okay, but you get the drift, right? So it's the bigger picture, and again, that's what I'm saying. We don't listen. I, I don't want you to copy and paste anything. I don't want you to remember. I need you to understand. Okay, that's what we are here for. If we're truly gonna make a difference, we need to understand. If we're truly gonna make a difference, we need to stop sitting down and talking. Because Miss Bullock can talk for three hours. I don't see if y'all noticed that. But where's the action? Where, where are we making a difference in getting things done? Stop sitting down and talking. We have to learn to make a difference. We are the future leaders. Please remember what we learned and when we get in these positions, Please make a difference. We can make a difference when crime go up and crime ain't even in, being no more longer in the low areas and they hit the wealthy people like Albany, Serenity, and like the right. so let's not wait. Let's let's be 
proactive and not reactive. Let's not wait. Okay? Let's not wait. Okay, so back to the IMF. So these international regulators, they always on our case, they always making us do these things that ain't conducive for our country. And we have to do it or we suffer consequences, right? However, in 2018, the IMF did come in and, and that's that um, time frame. That was from 2018, this old, but just to, to facilitate this story. So they came in and they said, um, we were working with the FATF to go over, you know, help, help you with the mutual evaluation. But they did a consultative report when they left and they said, um, we're not happy with your disaster relief plan. And so therefore we need you to um, upgrade it before we leave. And so normally, you know, people say, oh, give us 90 days and we put a plan in, in, in place, but they were adamant that it needed to be fixed, okay? Mm -hmm. And so to satisfy, I think they had like about six or seven recommendations within the consultative paper. And one of them were taxes. And so of course, we you know, we had used this staggered approach because we was a tax jurisdiction. We did update the law. Now, I don't know if it's a staggered approach again or an intentional, I think it was intentional. Because when we did update the law, we told them that, or the law had stated that if you defraud customs and VAT, you will be prosecuted. So that made all the people who still had their money here from China and the US and Canada who were not paying taxes could not be prosecuted because it was not the Indian law. So that was like a minor glitch in the law that they pointed out that we need to be fixed. So I think the Bahamas was just giving time for everybody to get their money out or to disclose to their IRS or whatever. Because I had a customer most recently in 2020, um, the bank was shutting down and the IRS sent us a letter and said, listen, we are in the process of prosecuting this person. This person has been charged with tax evasion and they have $10 million with y'all. Um, please do not close that account. Please hold this account until we decide what their fine was. And, it was right down to that day where we sent to the IRS and said, listen, the bank is closing. We are going to have to pay $100,000 for a license if we go over into the new year, into 2021. And they said, okay, $6 million is the fine. And that person, I talked with literally cried on that phone because we sent him $4 million and we sent the IRS $6 million, right? And so on, at that time, they had just changed the law. And so at the time then he, um, tax evaded, that wouldn't have been a law, uh, uh, um, that would not have been a law in the payment book. So he could have won that on a technicality. Now, I don't know who his lawyer was, but they would have had to fight I, um, the IRS. And so I guess he just let it go since they were, you know what I mean, uh, charging him. So yeah, um, half, more than half of his money went to the IRS. Okay, so we fixed that in, in 2020 of December. Um, but anyway, nevertheless, the IMF, you know, so because we knew we had that little glitch and it needed to fix, uh, we wanted to satisfy, you know, any other requests that we could right away. And so they said disaster relief plan has to be fixed. And picture it, this is December, which 2018. Now there is an insurance that cost $900,000 that the country was paying for. And at the time the PLP was in power, and the PLP had said, I'm not paying this insurance any longer because we had Hurricane Joaquin and they said that we didn't get a payout because we didn't have excessive rain. And then we had Hurricane Matthew and then they said, we cannot get payout because it was not a category five. So what is the probability of us having excessive rain in a category five? We're canceling this insurance, okay? So by the time the FNM came in power, um, now presented with the um, IMF saying, what are you gonna do? So they said, listen, we'll pay this insurance right away. So of course, you know, it had to go to Parliament and Parliament, the PLP, the same people who said, oh, what's the probability? Why are you wasting this money? And they said, listen, we have to satisfy the requirement of the IMF before they leave, you know? And so, but the PLP still opposed it. It makes no sense to not pay that insurance. So anyway, um, to satisfy this requirement, they paid the insurance of $900,000. Then there are dormant funds that come into 
the central bank each year to the sum of $88 billion over the last 20 years. So what the Bahamas government did is they changed the laws because even though those the law says you have unclaimed property within a financial institution after seven years, after seven years of no contact with that customer, the financial institution must then send that to the central bank for safekeeping. After, um, and the central bank just keeps it forever. Okay, puts it into the, the consolidated fund, I guess, whatever. So I've had persons over the years who have come back and claimed their dormant funds, like, and it was at the central bank for like 10 years. And so central bank changed the, um, laws to say, okay, the bank, the financial institution is going to keep it for seven years before they transfer it to us. You have three years to come to the central bank. If you don't come within three years of paying your dormant funds, then it belongs to the Bahamas government. Hmm. So could you imagine, like I said, to the sum of $88 million, the, to this law, the Bahamas just was able to take that money. So these people whose money would have been there for three years cannot come back and claim it any longer. So along with paying the $900,000 insurance, and again, this is a popular question on the exam. They paid the $900,000 insurance. They um, separated the dormant account fund. So 44 million, they said half of it will go towards disaster recovery. So $44 million from dormant funds. And then um, $100 million line of credit to the um, IDB they put in place. So they said, this is our action plan. And, should we have a natural disaster, this is what we would leverage on and this is what we would use. Okay, so I think they would have put that in place sometime in January to March of 2019. Tell me why this was important and what happened in September of 2019. Dorian Apple. Dorian. Yeah, yep. So Dorian Apple. Okay, and thank God. We had that in place, okay? So the first time we was able to smile upon the international regulator and say, okay, so perhaps what you're telling us does make sense, okay? Because again, we felt like you was trying to wipe us out, paying this $900,000, but we can put that to, you know, other useful things for the country, okay? So, and guess what? Like Hakidas had said, what's the probability of us having excessive rain? That hurricane hovered over, I would go for three days, over oh, Freeport for three days. And we had excessive rain. And it was a category five, okay? And the last time something like that had happened was in 19, I think, 24 or something like that, in two years prior, okay? So it was very good that that was in place. Nicole, go ahead. Hi, Ms. Ballard. So my question is when the law was changed for persons to come and claim their funds from central bank being given just the three-year period, the funds that were already sitting in that holding account, how did that affect the funds? Like, did the three years come into play automatically, or did the three years start from the date the law was passed? Well, the, I think from the day the law had passed, if that money was already there, I think they had said, if your money was already there for 10 years, it belongs to the Bahamas government, and they had I guess more than 44 million that was already there for, for you know, they did make a stipulation for the money that was currently there. And I okay. think any new money going in then would have been, you know, three years, the central bank would hold it because yeah, your institution would have held it for seven. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So they did, so they acquired that 88 million based on how long it would have been there. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so in, any questions so far? We, we see the three-prong approach is, is very beneficial to the Bahamas. We see um, we did it right in time. The regulators gave us good advice. It's a good thing they insisted. Um, Tanil, you want to add something? I want a little bit of clarification. So what, we, what you were saying is that an average, you gave a figure. I can't recall the figure, but that average number is what would go into central bank, um, I guess, yearly. So that's what they normally use to pay this insurance of 900,000 or no? no. That 900,000 is completely separate and apart from central bank, okay? That 900,000, the, the Bahamas government pays that. The dormant funds at the central bank is funds where 
clients would have gone into a bank, opened an account, and they have never contacted the bank. So persons may have died. They move away to the other country. Um, I had um, some husbands separate from wives. I had um, one woman where, you know, I tried to call her for years and she would answer the phone and just not. Yeah. She said, this is. Hello? Stole it from, you know, the Royal Bank. And she said. You can hear me? Hi. Yeah, I could hear you. Sorry, sorry. No, that was my brother calling me. Sorry. Okay, yeah, she wasn't talking to me. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so just mute your mic. Yeah. So, yeah, she had said her father had died and left her an inheritance. Gave her all the information. However, um, she married. She was married and her husband didn't treat her well and she was not leaving the money. They didn't have children. She was not leaving the money to him. And so, therefore, she didn't care. She knew that it would go to the central bank after seven years. And she said, she just basically said, rather than leave it to him, she would let the Bahamas government have it. And so I said, so why are you calling now? She said, because he died. So I'm coming to get my money. Now, luckily this happened before the law changed because that had been, I, I think it, it was about 15 or 16 years in total. So she would have she would have lost that completely, but he died so she came and got her money. And she said she'll spend it or and leave whatever to charity. Yes, Owen, go ahead. Okay, um, with the dormant account, you still saying it's seven years that the commercial banks hold it before it goes to central bank, correct? Oh, offshore banks, yeah. Or offshore anyway, banks. Yeah. Um, so if a, if an account is inactive, let's say you have a business account, let's say you got an account in 2020 and the pandemic hit. And you're you are you're you're not a person, but you're not you're an association or your business. Um and the pandemic hit, so you know everything was closed down and what have you. Um is uh it can you can that be looked at on a case by case basis or is the compliance rule for that hard and fast? Normally, internal policy says that after six months you must contact your customer if there's no um um contact after six months they call it a recalcitrant account where you can't make contact because you are required to know your customer you are supposed to be talking to them once every two years so after six months sometimes a year it becomes an active then it moves on to to dormant so it takes like a, and again it just depends on your internal policy so by year three you're probably dormant and by year seven we are preparing to send you every February, we send to the, the central bank and every year we have had accounts. I talk about into the millions of dollars where we've tried to reach out to these foundations, to these companies and, and nobody has responded. If nobody responds, it goes to the central bank. And there's a lot of stealing that happens across dormant accounts because they know that nobody checking. So they are high risk and they are monitored carefully. There was a lot of fraud. Okay, so if you're on one of those accounts, call no matter that if the pandemic um, um, has happened, there's a statutory requirement now to monitor. That means it's required by law. So you might have slipped through the cracks back in the day, but now they're required to monitor you. Okay? Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so yeah, you can read the rest about the FSAP and you know stuff like that in terms of the FAD. So let's go through chapter four um, quickly. Again, the Bahamian legal system. Um, it outlines the crime of money laundering, um, outlining terrorism financing, outlining which businesses are subject to AML CFT laws. Um, it names the law enforcement and government bodies that have access to reports. Um, it creates creating a regulator to oversee compliance with the legislation. And again, back to international law, Bahamian law, your regulator's guidelines, and then your internal policy. Okay. And so in the um, AML framework of the Bahamas, is about 10 laws that fit in these laws. Again, you'll see it at the beginning of your regulator's guideline, and it's the proceeds of crime act that they refer to as POCA, the Anti-Terrorism Act, um, 
the Financial Intelligence Act, Travelers Currency Declaration Act, and, and these were the laws that were deficient with the recommendations and have to, had to be updated. So you would see that a lot of them, they were established like the Financial Intelligence Unit Act, 2000, and then it says as amended. So amendments would have been made. Some of them were so deficient, they had to be repealed and replaced. So you would see that the FTRA is now 218, the Anti-Terrorism Act had so many changes that they had to repeal and replace it. And even the Proceeds of Crime Act had to be repealed and replaced. And again, like I said, these incorporate those 40 recommendations, all international standard, um, some principles from the Basel Committee, some principles from Transparency International, all of these can be found in this legislative framework. And if we look at, at some of the law, I'll probably pull it up next week so we can just, again, it's another very complex situation. I don't wanna you know, overwhelm you any further. Um, if we look at the law, you know, they use words for like entirely a lot of Latin words, instrumentalities and stuff, and it's not easily interpreted. That's why um, lawyers make lots of money. And then they have the law and then these amendments. So you have to know how to read the amendments along with the law to make sure that um, you fully understand um, what it entails. Okay. But this is considered the Bahamas AML framework, these seven or eight laws. Um, that have been written. And so um, the Travelers Currency Declaration as, as amended, um, that affects all of us, um, all of us who travel to Miami and all these various countries. What happened was with the Travelers Currency then that was updated, um, American law had said, you must declare $10,000 when you travel to the US. So we had a very prominent doctor, female. I don't know if any of you have ever traveled to Canada or Cuba, you don't go to the international section, you go to the domestic section and you catch the plane to Cuba or Air Canada to Canada. Have any of you ever gone on that side? Yes. Yeah, and so then there's also Air Jamaica. And so on that side, um, uh, this very prominent lady doctor, she was going back to Jamaica and she had $200,000 cash. And she did not declare that um, she had that $200,000 $200, cash. So when it went to the, the checker thing, um, you know, it beeped off and they arrested her. Now, her husband used to be a politician years ago. And so he called the prime minister at that time and said, you know, she has been arrested, what can you do? And there was a lot of public outcry because of course they let her go, but they let her go and they said, we're gonna confiscate the money. But they found out like in about two days or so, they could not confiscate the money because it was American law that you must declare, not Bahamian law. And she was going on Air Jamaica, not on an American airline. And so they had to return that money to her. So of course, internationally, they saw that as a glitch and they updated. And so now, no matter where you go, you it's now behaving law that you must declare $10,000 or more. And we've seen that a lot of persons have been arrested for non-disclosure um, and no declaration. So please ensure even if you go into Cuba or Canada or Jamaica on the domestic side, you do declare because it's now Bahamian law. And most recently um, in the news, uh, the casinos must be working with uh, the airlines or TSA or whatever you call those people, because we have had two cases recently where some guys came for spring break, they won $30,000, they did not declare, and they were searched. What they did is each person took, I think it was three of them or five of them, each of them took like $5,000 on their person, but they were traveling as a group. And so collectively, it, it's not only you, it's even if you're in a group, you must declare whether you have $10,000 cash or more. And so they decided that they weren't gonna declare and they were searched and that money was confiscated. Ms. Butler, and, I have a question, please. I'm ahead. not to interrupt you. Yes, um, but, in a, but in a case like that, if you are in a group, let's say you don't know um, what other persons in your group may have on them in terms of their cash, could they still hold you responsible for that? Yes. 
Yes, because oh. even if it's a church group or, you know, uh, uh, collectively, you have to discuss it. And, you know, I stood in front of TSA with my significant other and I said, I, how can you ask me? I'm TSA, yeah. I said, can I write it down? And he's like, no, you must say it out loud. I said, do you know this is going to affect my shopping when I reach He said, mom, would you like to be under arrest? So, <laughs> you know, yeah, you, you have to declare. So if you go on our way with the church and if somebody lies, I guess, you know, um, that's not your fault, but they'll have to, to, to prove it. That person who did not declare that they had that certain amount. Yeah. Mm, okay. So you must find out and prepare because like I said, they are, uh, I don't know if they watch you from when you walk. Of course they watch you from when you walk into the airport. But the casinos have to be calling them because at least three or four persons who would have won big at the casino was arrested and confiscated and those, those guys who were so happy because they probably scrapped to come here for, for what is it called, a spring break, won that $30,000. The judge confiscated the entire 30000 and then charged them $1,500 fine. So, they even lost their parents had to come and get them out of jail. Yeah, so just be careful and, and declare because that's how the law was updated to include all. So whoever you travel with, I guess, or whoever you purchase your ticket along with, you must know that you all combined do, do not have $10,000. Or just declare, if you declare, it's fine. They don't take it from you. You're allowed to travel with it, you just must declare it. Okay. So Ms. Bullard, if I, if I could ask one just curious question. So if you say you have 15,000 because you're going over with the intention of buying a car or something, and you say you have 15,000, that's it? That's all they want to know is that's that you're it. coming in with that, cash? That's it. That is it. All yeah. you have to do is provide the source of funds and that's it. Remember now, the purpose is to avoid money laundering. And so once you have source document, there's no, there's no problem. They may say it's not safe to travel with that amount of cash. And, and, and once you can prove it's not a drug deal, then it's fine. Same thing with the bank. When you go and you open up an account, you set a profile. If this amount is outside of the profile, you might've gotten an inheritance. Um, you might've sold a piece of property. If you could prove that, then that's fine. Um, what's his name? Um, Brent Seminet um, declared when he was running for government um, that he had $50 million. Five years later, when he ran again, he had $150 million. And of course, they blocked all his accounts and it was, uh, it was an outcry of where did he get $100 million from in five years? He had these people money. No, his mother died and left him $100 million. And the people was mad. But you should try and figure out how to leave your child $100 million. Okay? So not everybody is a criminal. Okay? But you must be vigilant and you must monitor. And if they provide proof, then it's fine. But people just don't like to declare. And we don't want you to know in our business. And somebody said, yeah, declaring is not hard. They really only want to know where you get the cash and what you plan to do with it, and that's it. But we don't like the people in our business. So we ain't telling them nothing. We rather take a risk. I don't know why. Makes no sense. Once you are not money laundering, you should be able to declare. Okay? Claire's mud? Yeah, okay. O Owen, did you get the email? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. All right. Okay, guys, so um, just try and digest all of that. Um, relax and unwind and feel good. And then um, if you have not done your homework, try to look at the questions and see if, if um, you can answer them. But just look over them and make sure that once we finish the chapter that you can answer them and you know where to find the information and you know make it make sense. Okay, but feel good. Try to enjoy the rest of your weekend. Ms. Bullard, um, mind go ahead. The, the course is after you ended the course. Can you stay back for a moment where I can ask you a question if it's not too much? Time? Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. That's no problem. Okay. But everybody else could go and celebrate their weekend. Right? Good day.
Okay, good day. Have a fabulous weekend and take care. We'll see good you afternoon. Next week. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Okay, take okay. care. Bye bye. Good afternoon. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, Miss Bullet, I guess you could say if you can't answer or you could answer, but I was trying to understand and fathom the simple thing from um, chapter one where they were talking about currency exchange and I was trying to figure out how that works. And I want to know if this is how I'm thinking about it is correct. It's be like, it'll be like how we have cash and go, I think it's called, and persons from different, I guess, backgrounds, national backgrounds would go there and just send money off to their different, um, I guess, countries like Barbados, Jamaica, and you would send this Bahamian money and you don't know if it's illegal or is that wrong and how I'm thinking about it. Okay, tell me what page you are referring to, just like- When you're talking about the three stages and then they're talking particularly about um, <laughs> placement and they were talking about some of the ways this is achieved and they're naming currency exchanges one. I wanted to try and understand better what they actually mean when they're saying currency exchange. Okay, so there are many, you know, like many ways to um, defraud the system. And so we had, there was a case um, at road traffic where um, somebody was reported to be taking bribes and, you know, money underneath the counter um, to license cars and stuff like that or give out badges. And these people were not, you know, having the proper insurance and what have you. And so they said that they would set this person up. And so um, what they did is they marked the bills and they paid the person on the table and the person gave them the, um, you know, the badge or whatever they needed or they licensed the vehicle. That person went to the cashier's cage and exchanged the money. Because, you know, because they just didn't trust. They didn't know the bills were marked. And so then he went back to his office and he took a seat. Like within an hour, police came with a subpoena to say they needed to search him and whatever, and they would have arrested him had he had those marked bills on him. And so they searched him, found the money on him. However, it was not the marked bills. And so when they did a, uh, an investigation, you know, he was able to say, it's not me, you're, you know, you're blaming the wrong person. And so they said, well, um, we just paid this person that say $200 and you have $200 on you. He said, yes, I do, but um, um, it would, I, this is, you know, how can you prove where I got this money from? And so they did a further investigation and when they counted the cash cage, they later found that the money, the mark money was in the teller's cage, right? So he was just smart. He was just smarter than they were, you know? And so that's what a lot of people do when they're drug dealing or when they, you know, another case too, when the bank was robbed, the lawyer who, um, there's something that is called bait, the lawyer, um, the tellers are encouraged that if the bank gets robbed to drop the bait money into the robbery bag, if you could. And that's what they did. They dropped the bait money in. And that same lawyer for the, who was representing um, went into the bank to deposit the bait money because that's the money that they paid. And so they arrested that lawyer, but then found out that, oh, we have many clients and whatever. And we, that's how we knew that that was the person who had robbed the bank. You know, and so um, they do their various different tactics to, you know, defraud the system or to um, exchange money, you know, um, just to, you know, lessen your chances of being poor. Sometimes they go uh, um, and get US. Sometimes they, um, well, you only have Bahamian in US. Um, some people will go if the money has to go to a different, you know, somewhere in Europe, they will go and get, um, what is it, GBP or, or Euros or, or, or what have you. So it's just various different tactics that um, they use. So in order to, you know, so you can't track them to diminish the audit trail there. Okay, so that helps. So uh, 
a simple example would be just like how you take you carry funds to the bank and say, I'm going to the States, I want to exchange this money and I'll just pay the rate. So basically that's like a currency exchange where you claim your money as well. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So they essentially, like I say, they just want to, the dirty money, they just want to watch because, you know, it's easy. If people are going to set you up, that's the easiest way for them to set you up with the, the um, serial numbers, you know? And so that's good evidence to have against you. And so, that what they do is try to, you know, break this hundred down for me or, you know, change this into another currency that I could still use. They ain't necessarily going away. They just trying to get rid of that cash in case those bills are marked. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you so much, Ms. Bullard. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, is there, is there anything else? I see Michael is still here, Renee. Hi, Ms. Bullard. Hi. Do we have to remember every single act in detail? And also, I saw that you sent us the outline that the ICA required for us answering our questions. But for the for the intro, do we still have the site? Yeah. Okay. So, with the first question, no, you don't have to. You won't remember. Like, like Owen just asked me a question, and I, I don't know, right? And so. I have a lot of information in my head, but a lot of things I still have to do, do research. And so that's the importance of keeping your library. You must be information seeking and you must know where to get this information from. And, and you don't have to give it right away. Like I said, give me till next week, go in and I'll do some research and we'll have a discussion. Okay, so don't be overwhelmed, but this is too much information. Nobody can ever remember it. Okay? okay, and then the ICA book is really only for referencing in the way they do it because, like I said, a lot of persons have um, lost up to 20%, 30% because they did not reference properly. And so I want you to practice the way they do it. So don't worry so much about the other pages other than 17 to 19 on how to reference. So practice. Okay. Okay. So for us, it's just a regular GPR answering question it's just a regular what what did you say oh sorry it's a regular question you know in high school they gave us those those kind of questions and it wasn't an essay question you just write from your studies and answer the question from the yeah, book but it, yeah it's an essay it's an essay question and, and you want to ensure you you quote and, and you reference properly yeah and you want the introduction the conclusion and the body and, and what happened Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. See you next week. Just, okay, take care. Ms. Puller, just really quickly, please. I just wanted to clarify, like for the for the final, I know you said that it will be seven essay questions. Are they actually like essay questions? Like how the homework assignment is a an essay? Yeah, it is, but it's only a one pager. Whereas the homework is practiced more for ICA and it requires the thousand to twelve hundred words. Oh. In the final exam, it's just a one page. Okay, it's so just was... a one, one and a half page, yeah, of 10 points. All right, as opposed to this um, 1500 page, right. 1500 word that we're doing now. Yes, yes, that All 1500 right. word is just practice by ICA. And those four questions are past exam questions. So that's why I say it's good to practice. Oh, okay, I got you. All right, so I should have my, 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 my question in for next class. And then, like you said, I'll do the other ones for practice. Okay, great. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Bullock. All right, you too, okay, I'll take care. Have a good one, bye-bye. You, you too. This is my advice. Jesus.